Songs of consecration are sometimes very hard to sing. The last phrase, last two lines of the hymn we just sang, I hope you meant it. I hope you meant it. And Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. Oh, give me grace to follow my master and my friend. That means a lot to me. Because I have promised to follow Jesus by the grace of God to the end. Take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a few moments ago. We're in the book of Exodus. We're in chapter 6. Today we're looking at verses 7 and 8. And we raise the question, the Jews, as God's people, is the church Israel? The Jews, as God's people, is the church Israel. Look at verse 7 with me just a moment again. God has given a whole series of I wills. He said how he appeared to Abraham. He said how he had established his covenant. He said how he had heard the groaning of the children of Israel. And he remembered his covenant. And then he gives a whole series of I wills. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. I will rid you out of their bondage. I will redeem you with a stretched out arm with great judgments. I will, and this is our phrase for today, I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God. And ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you for an heritage. I am the Lord. You get the idea that God has decided he's going to do something? These are the great I wills of God. How many of those I wills are allegorical? How many of those are spiritualized? Versus how many of those are literal? Verse 7, I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the hand the burden of the Egyptians. Rather important statements by God. Either he's telling us the truth or he's not. Either these are all literal or they are not. You can't take some of them literally and some of them allegorically and spiritualize them. And that's why we ask the question today, the Jews as God's people is the church Israel? Or do we have to take that one claim in verse 7 allegorically and spiritualize it and say, no, that refers to the church. That does not refer to Israel as a national group of people whom God redeemed by his outstretched and powerful and mighty hand from the harm that was being done them by the Egyptians. Now, in our 13-part study, we learned 28 specific things about the covenant of the land. We studied three reasons that God cast the people out of the land, even though he promised to bring them back. He cast them out because of stubbornness, stiff-neckedness, and rebellion. We studied chastening, and how God chastens both Israel and his people. He gave them to us as a visible example of how he will deal with us today in the church. We learned four key lessons. One, how God deals with Israel as an elect group of people. Gives visible illustration of how God deals with us as elect individuals because he loves us and because he wants to have fellowship with us. The second lesson that we learned was God is the one who sovereignly works repentance in the heart of man in his time. That's the doctrine of election and predestination applied to real time in real history in the sphere of time and space. Their application is not theoretical. It is not merely theological. It is world shattering because God uses predestinating purposes to accomplish his will in this world. The third lesson that we learned was that repentance is not normal. It's not a normal human response. Because when we're confronted with sin, we always want to make excuses for it. Repentance is not even normal when we're suffering because of sin. 
Usually we stubbornly resist. We don't want to make a connection between our suffering and our sin. Now we know that not all suffering is a result of our personal sin, but some of our suffering is. We all suffer because sin entered into the world through Adam and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. But some of our personal suffering and the suffering of others is a result of our personal sin. Your sin not only causes you to suffer, your sin causes other people to suffer. The problem is sin, which the world does not want to admit exists. And so without the sovereign work of God, we do not repent, we resist. The fourth lesson that we learned, which is where we closed last week, was with that backdrop we saw how repentance fits into the prophetic future of Israel. The final repentance of Israel and the full possession of the land is scheduled to occur at the second coming of Christ. That's not merely a statement in Deuteronomy chapter 30, which we looked at, but that's consistent in the New Testament, that God is not through dealing with his national people, Israel, the Jews. Peter preached national repentance and restoration to the Jews in Acts chapter 3 before the return of Christ. And that was, you recall, in the temple after the healing of the lame man, to the Jew first. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. That's a reference back to that Hosea 6 passage that we studied some weeks ago. And then he says in verses 25 and 26, Ye are the children of the prophets, and the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. That's the same argument that Paul makes in Romans chapter 11, which we've looked at in the past also. Unto you first, that is to the Jew first, God having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. That's repentance. And so Peter is preaching national repentance and restoration of the Jews before the coming of Christ. We saw the restoration of all the Jews from all over the earth will be part of the millennial return. Isaiah chapter 11, we looked at verses 6 through 10. It talks all about the wolf is going to dwell with the lamb, leopard is going to lie down with the kid, calf is going to be with a young lion, the fatling together, a young child shall lead them, and so on. And in verse 10 it says, And in that day shall there be a root of Jesse, which is our Lord Jesus Christ, which shall stand up for an ensign of the people, to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. If you were with us on Wednesday evening, we talked about those ensigns, 200 foot tall poles that were in Egypt, that were the ensigns of the God of Egypt, and then Jehovah declares after his battle at Rephidim against the Amalekites that he will be the banner, the ensign of Israel. Powerful, powerful stuff. Oh, I wish you were with us on Wednesday evening. Anyway, but Jesus himself is going to be the ensign to the people. The banner, the flag, to it shall the Gentiles seek. They will follow that banner. And Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's claiming to be the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. And there's verse 11. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamat and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel. They are different. And gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. People, God still has that plan for national Israel. James reminded the Jerusalem council all the way down to Acts chapter 15. We've had the Jews come in in Acts chapter 2. And it's Jewish males, all Jewish males in Acts chapter 2. If you've been with us when we went through the study on Acts in the evening messages, we saw the specific technical terms for males in chapter 2. We get to Acts chapter 8. We have people who are men and women, and they are half Jewish and half Gentile, Samaritans. And they are brought in. We get into Acts chapter 10 and we find Gentiles, 100% Gentile. They are Gentiles, Romans, and they are brought in. We get to Acts 16, we find a female head of the household and her family brought in. People, you see an expansion of the gospel as you're moving through the book of Acts. We get to Acts chapter 15 finally. And all these different groups have already been brought in. So you'd think that if Israel was the church and the church was Israel, that by Acts chapter 15, it would be clear. But in Acts chapter 15, at the first gigantic council of the church, the Jerusalem council, James reminds the Jerusalem council of the coming repentance and national conversion of national Israel. 
They're discussing at that point whether circumcision is required for Gentiles. And Acts 15, 15, and 16, and to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written, After this I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. That's Jewish, folks. Now the residue, that's the faithful remnant in Israel. We talked about how that word residue is what's called a hapax legomena. That's the only occurrence of that particular word in the entire New Testament. Of men might seek after the Lord. And all the Gentiles. It's not talking about Gentiles being brought in that first part when it talks about the remnant. The remnant principle is a Jewish principle all the way through the Old Testament. You see that God saves out a remnant who are faithful to him. He talks about the remnant of Israel and the Gentiles. And James is talking about it in Acts chapter 15. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Final verse. We saw that verses 16 and 17 are a quotation from the prophet Amos. Amos chapter 9 verses 11 and 12. In that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen down. That's a Jewish prophet, folks. And close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. That's what James is quoting in, J in Acts chapter 15. That they will possess the remnant of Eden, and all of the heathen, which are called by my name, saith the Lord, that doeth this. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper. This is millennial. And the treader of grapes, him that soweth the seed. Things are growing so fast. Uh, the guy is sowing them, and, and before they can even get it going to... The plants are growing up and they're cutting them down and they're taking over each other so fast. God is going to cause incredible reproduction during the millennial period. The mountains shall drop sweet wine and all the hills shall melt. And you know we saw that that is what Isaiah prophesies in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 4. Amos is prophesying the same thing. You know the passage from Handel's Messiah. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The mountains and the hills are going to melt. And the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. That's quoted in Luke chapter 3. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough way shall be made smooth. That's Luke 3, 5. And that's the context of John the Baptist preaching repentance to national Israel. Scripture is an indivisible unit. All the dots always connect. In verse 3. He, John the Baptist, came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And then he quotes that passage out of Isaiah chapter 40, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God, ends that passage in verse 6. We saw the rest of the Amos passage is a literal physical return and physical blessing of the Jewish people. The very next verse, I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities. They shall inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards. They shall drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens. They shall eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land. And they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. Now emphasizing that, because that takes us into what we're going to be studying today. It's a clear statement repudiating what's called replacement theology. Replacement theology is very popular among covenant theologians today. Replacement theology says that the church has replaced national Israel and God has abandoned all of his promises to national Israel. In other words, the Jews no longer have any claim to the promises of God as a nation for their land or for any other reason. That's a very, very serious issue. You may not know it, but that's an issue that's been fought since about 160 A.D. The people today who don't even know that issue exists, they just sort of float into the mass and mash that has been developing. Well, we'll talk about that in just a second. That's the key issue for our topic of our message today, the Jews as God's people, is the church. Israel. We closed last week by seeing more Israeli repentance prophesied by Jesus that will occur at the Great Tribulation. Matthew 24, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and so on. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And all the tribes of the earth shall mourn. They're going to see the sign of the, the, they shall see the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven coming with great power and glory. And then we saw down there in verse 24, it said, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And you'll recall, I hope you recall, I hope you were listening last week, because this is a very hot issue. This is all over the internet today. This is being pushed like crazy in a lot of reformed churches 
the doctrine of preterism. Preterism says that all the prophecies of Matthew 24, which is called the Mount of Olivet Discourse, that all the prophecies of Matthew 24 have been fulfilled in 70 AD when Titus destroyed the city of Jerusalem. The Roman general Titus came in, surrounded the city of Jerusalem, besieged it for three years, and in 70 AD managed to breach the walls, burn the temple, carry all the articles that were in the temple back to Rome, and the Jews went into what's been called the Third Diaspora, the Third Dispersion. The Preterists say that all the prophecies concerning the return of Christ and everything else were fulfilled at that point. And God was finished with the Jews at that point. It was over and out. And they say that this proves it, verse 24, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And they say, ah, all these things, that entire Olivet Discourse about all the things that are going to happen in the future, it all took place in 70 AD when Titus destroyed the city of Jerusalem. I hope you recall that we answered the preterist claim that the phrase, this generation shall not pass, refers to the people who heard Christ speak. That's not what it refers to. The word this generation occurs 16 times in the New Testament, in some very key passages. The preterists say it refers to that generation who heard him speak. But that rips it out of its context. Because the context is the parable of the fig tree in the immediate two preceding verses. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation, the generation that sees those things happening, shall not pass till these things be fulfilled. And we saw that the fig tree is used by Jesus and elsewhere in scripture as a symbol for national Israel. When national Israel begins to bloom again. Jesus had cursed the fig tree, you recall. It had withered right before he came into the city of Jerusalem. And Jesus says, it's going to be restored. Paul says in Romans 11, God broke off the natural branches so that he could graft you as Gentiles into the root. And if that took, how much more when he regrafts the natural branches, referring to Israel, back into the root? It's coming. And yet the preterists say it'll never happen. That totally refutes preterism. And that should give eager anticipation to our generation. Israel is a nation reborn on May 14, 1948. A nation born in a day, according to Isaiah 66, verse 8, written 800 years before Christ, and fulfilled on May 14, 1948. The branch is tender, it's putting forth leaves. That means that it's this generation that will see the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's near. So in summary, the covenant of the land related to specific literal land grant. We saw there are at least 21 specific land grant references in Genesis alone. I didn't get to read them all to you last week because I was closing it down. And we saw there are additional interwoven promises that support the literal prophesied covenant of the land. Six major areas of prophecy that guarantee that national Israel will have the entire land promised to Abraham from the Euphrates River on the east to the Nile River, the river of Egypt, on the west. How promises of the return of Messiah guarantee the land promises. How Israel's conversion as a nation guarantees the land promises. How judgment on the oppressors of national Israel implies a land and a nation. How future promised national blessings to Israel imply a land and a nation. How the promises of a king forever implies a land and a nation. How the promises of a throne forever implies a land and a nation. And we close with these words. Remember, this is the God who made his promises to you. This is the God who keeps his promises. If God doesn't keep his promises to Israel, we just read them in Exodus chapter 6, verse 7, where God says, you are going to be my people, I'm going to be your God. You can't take those two I wills out of that whole list of I wills of what God's going to do and say those two are allegorized. Those two refer to the church. Those don't refer to Israel. Either God is telling you the truth in all of them, and they're all literal, or God is not telling you the truth in any of them, and they're not literal. Okay. 
Now, I'm going to read you a series of extensive quotations to show that I'm not making it up about replacement theology and that it has deep roots in history. It's going to be a series of quotations. One man who used to attend this church said to me not long ago that I was making it all up. No, this has been a hot topic since the middle of the second century AD up to the present time. Let me read you some quotes. Quote, replacement theology is the view that the church is the new or true Israel that has permanently replaced or superseded Israel as the people of God. Another term often found in academic circles for replacement theology is supersessionism. Now, if you're in academia, if you follow any theological journals, if you read the stuff that's too boring to even go to sleep to, uh, the other word that is used in academia is supersessionism. Replacement theology, I continue the quotation, replacement theology has been the fuel that has energized medieval anti-Semitism, Eastern European pogroms, the Holocaust, and contemporary disdain for the modern state of Israel. Mike Vlach, and by the way, if you need any of these uh, references, I have the entire chain of references, all the different sources that are cited. This comes from his work, The Church as Replacement of Israel, an analysis of supersessionism. Yet it was his PhD dissertation at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. Um, so this is the guy that I'm quoting right now. I'll be quoting some other people here in just a second. Mike Vlach notes, the acceptance or rejection of supersessionism may also influence how one views the modern state of Israel and events in the Middle East. Wherever replacement theology has flourished, the Jews have had to run for cover." Unquote. Preterist and covenant theologian Kenneth Gentry defines replacement theology to which he holds, he believes it, as follows, quote, we believe that the international church has superseded for all times national Israel as the institution for the administration of divine blessing on the world, unquote. Gentry adds to his initial statement the following embellishment, quote, that is, we believe that in the unfolding of the plan of God in history, the Christian church is the very fruition of the redemptive purpose of God. As such, the multiracial, international church of Jesus Christ supersedes racial, national Israel as the focus of the kingdom of God. Indeed, we believe that the church becomes the Israel of God. Galatians 6.16, we'll be looking at some of these passages and analyzing their context to see if what he says is true. The seed of Abraham, Galatians 3.29, the circumcision of Philippians 3.3, the temple of God, Ephesians 2.19-22, and so forth. We believe that Jew and Gentile are eternally merged into, quote, a new man in the church of Jesus Christ, Ephesians 2.12-18, and then, quoting this out, totally out of context, what God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. That is certainly not very good exegesis. But anyway... Do all those passages teach what Kenneth Gentry says they teach? If you read them in their context, is that what it says? Now, some of the things he says are partially true. That's what gives the deception such power. Walt Kaiser, who was teaching at Gordon Theological Seminary when uh, I went to college at Gordon College, tells us that replacement theology, quote, declares that the church, Abraham's spiritual seed, had replaced national Israel in that it had transcended and fulfilled the terms of the covenant given to Israel, which covenant Israel had lost because of disobedience. So they lost the covenant that God made with them based on his own name? European scholar Ronald DePose defines replacement theology as follows, quote, the church completely and permanently replaced ethnic Israel in the working out of God's plan and as recipient of Old Testament promises addressed to Israel." Unquote. In the view of the supersessionists, that is people who believe replacement theology, they believe that Israel is a has-been and has no future in the plan of God. They believe that the church inherits all the blessings while Israel is meant only to endure the curses. Remember the blessings and the cursings from Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim? If they do certain things, they'll be blessed. If they do certain things, they'll be cursed. 
Let me give you a little more here. Replacement theology has been the consensus of the church from the middle of the second century to the present day with few exceptions. Even though the anti-Nicene fathers were predominantly premillennial in their understanding of future things, they laid a groundwork that would lead to a rise and development of replacement theology. Premillennialist Justin Martyr was the first to view, quote, the Christian church as the true spiritual Israel around 160 AD. Justin's views laid the groundwork now, note, you don't find any of that before 160 AD. You don't find that in the early church. You don't find that in the book of Acts. You don't find that in the apostolic writings. You don't find that in the disciples of those who were the apostles at the time of Christ. Justin's views laid the groundwork for the growing belief that the church had superseded or replaced Israel. Quote, Misunderstanding of it colors the church attitude to Judaism and contributes to anti-Semitism, notes Peter Richardson. He adds, in spite of the many attributes, uh, characteristics, prerogatives of the latter, which are applied to the former, the church is not called Israel in the New Testament. The continuity between Israel and the church is partial and the discontinuity between Israel before Christ and its continuation A.D. is partial. In other words, you can see similarities. Because God chose to use visible national Israel to teach certain principles about how God deals with his people. But that does not mean that the church is Israel. God is using Israel to teach us. We've talked about that in great detail in the past. Kaiser points paints the following developmental picture in the early church, quote, Replacement theology is not a new arrival in the theological arena, for it probably has its origins in the early political ecclesiastical alliance forged between Eusebius Pamphilius and the emperor Constantine. That's in the 300s. Constantine regarded himself as God's representative in his role as emperor, gathered all the bishops together on the day of his Trisenalia, that's the 30th anniversary of his reign, an event, incidentally, which he saw as the foreshadowing of the eschatological messianic banquet. Now, Constantine was a pagan. He baptized all his troops when he saw the sign of the cross in the sky, and he did it by standing next to the river and throwing buckets of water on them. And that made them all Christians, right? The results of that meeting in Eusebius' mind made it unnecessary to distinguish any longer between the church and the empire. Folks, what do we have? Roman Catholicism beginning to bloom. For they appeared to merge into one fulfilled kingdom of God on earth in the present time. Such a maneuver, of course, nicely evacuated the role and the significance of the Jewish people in any kingdom considerations. Here began the long trail of replacement theology. Unquote. This gentleman didn't know his historical theology when he told me there's no such thing as replacement theology. Where would you ever get a term like that? Folks, this has been an argument, a battle going on in the church since 160 A.D. And it is a rather significant battle because it led to the rise of Romanism. It's one of the key issues that got a Roman Catholic papacy established. And it doesn't exist. People, we have a very serious problem on our hands. Houston, are you listening? Impact of replacement theology. Let me give you a little more. Quote, the doctrine of replacement theology reflects a wide range of Christian thinking, notes Menachem ben Haim, Jewish guy. From utterly malignant anti-Jewish hatred to simple misunderstanding and misapplication of biblical texts, unquote. Since Israel is a subject found on just about every page of the Old Testament, to get that subject wrong can only lead to a mega distortion of scripture. This has indeed been the case throughout the history of the church. You understand why I feel so fervently about this issue of God's promises for Israel, why I spent 13 weeks on the covenant of the land, why I firmly believe that Israel is not the church and the church is not Israel, that they are two distinct entities within the plan of God for different purposes at different times in history, so that God might get the greatest amount of glory and he's a God who keeps his covenant he always tells the truth he does not lie and he means what he says and he says what he means 
A friend of mine is named Arnold Fruchtenbaum. He married a classmate of mine at Gordon College, Arnie Fruchtenbaum, a really sort of a neat guy. And uh, you've heard me quote him on occasions in the past. He runs a, a great outreach ministry, REL Ministries, to uh, reach Jewish people and to train Gentiles in the Jewish backgrounds of uh, the scriptures. He is fond of saying, while the church is said to be a partaker in Israel's promises in the New Testament, nowhere is she said to be a taker over of Israel's promises. That's very important. Yes, we do partake of the, the wonderful blessings that come from the root because we've been grafted into the root. While Israel temporarily has been broken off, but Israel is going to be regrafted into the same root, according to Romans chapter 11. Let me give you another one. British commentator C.E.D. Canfield, Canfield, who is by no means a Bible-thumping fundamentalist, and the commentator here says, a rare moment in academia, provides the following appropriate apology. Quote, It is only where the church persists in refusing to learn this message, where it secretly, perhaps quite unconsciously, believes, now listen to this carefully, believes that its own existence is based on human achievement and so fails to understand God's mercy to itself. That it is unable to believe in God's mercy for still unbelieving Israel. And so entertains the ugly and unscriptural notion that God has cast off his people Israel and simply replaced it by the Christian church. That was what I was saying, and I hope I said it clearly at the end of the last message and as we opened this message today. God is a God who keeps his promises. If he didn't keep his promises to Israel, what makes you think he will keep his promises to you? God made clear national promises to a national entity that he was going to break off because of their sin and that he was going to revive because he still has a fulfillment to do in the future. He goes on. These three chapters, Romans 9 through 11, emphatically forbid us to speak of the church as having once and for all taken the place of the Jewish people. Now this guy is not a fundamentalist. This guy is not a rabid Bible beater. Uh, this guy is merely a scholar who's looking at the textual evidence but the assumption that the church has simply replaced Israel as the people of God is extremely common. And I confess with shame to having also myself used in print on more than one occasion this language of the replacement of Israel by the church. Unquote. I hope I've made my case that this is a major issue in the church today. It is a major issue that takes us back to the formation of the Roman Catholic Church. It is a key issue concerning the integrity of God. I think as we've just seen by the quotations from the early church fathers, replacement theology and amillennialism are historically Roman Catholic theology. When the Reformation occurred, the Reformers were fighting a different battle. They were fighting the battle of justification by faith, and we talked about that on Reformation Sunday a couple of weeks ago. They were not fighting battles of eschatology, other than to conclude that Rome was the Babylonian harlot, and you'll find Luther writing to that extent. Rome, you see, claimed at that time, and still claims, Rome claimed to be the true Israel of God. The Reformers looked at that and they said, that's a joke. They looked around, they saw no Jewish state. That didn't happen until 1948. And so they decided that if Rome is not the true Israel of God, they must be the true Israel of God. In other words, they essentially swallowed Roman Catholic theology and applied it to themselves because God had not yet brought Israel back to the land. Rather interesting. 1517, the Muslim Turks conquered what we know as Palestine. And it was under Ottoman rule for 400 years. 1517 is when Martin Luther nailed his theses to the door 
with the church in Wittenberg. Same year that the Ottoman Turks began to rule the Levant, Palestine. 400 years they ruled. All during that time, it was Muslim territory. Tremendous restrictions on Christians and Jews who wanted to go there. 1917, Lord Allenby conquered the Levant. We have first the charge of the Light Brigade down in Beersheba, which by the way has just been re-celebrated again. Troops from Australia and New Zealand were the ones who led that charge. And they just celebrated again down in Beersheba. How they drove the Turks north. And then finally drove them completely out of the land and Allenby entered the city of Jerusalem. You heard me preach on that. Now when he came to the gates of Jerusalem, he was riding a horse. But he dismounted from his horse. And he walked through the gates because he said, Only the Lord Jesus Christ has the right to ride into this city on a horse. And he will someday. 400 years. The reformers did not see the liberation of that land. They saw it under Muslim control. And all through the Reformation period, the same. And all through the history where replacement theology was developing and developing and developing so that the church is Israel and Israel is the church and church is Israel and Israel is the church and church is Israel and Israel is the church and all that kind of nonsense. But God keeps his word. It may not be within the time schedule that you and I think that it will be, but God keeps his word. The reformers unfortunately swallowed Roman Catholic theology and applied it to themselves because God hadn't brought Israel back to the land yet. Now, in our study of the covenant of the land, we gave extensive support for the promised future for national Israel from the Bible, not from the wildly developing historical theology, but the final touchstone in every case is scripture, not what has developed over the course of political and theological history. We find the term Israel is used in Paul's letters quite a number of times. In fact, Paul uses the term Israel than any place else in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, you do not find the use of the term Israel in the book of James. You do not find it in First and Second Peter. You do not find it in First, Second, Third John. You do not find it in the book of Jude. You find it three times in Revelation. All the rest are in the writings of Paul not counting the Gospels, where we're dealing with historical Jews in a historical context. All the rest of the writings of Paul. And yes, I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews because it occurs three times in the book of Hebrews, the term Israel. And I see our time is up. Well, I had divided this message into two parts, so we'll take that next week. But um, some key verses. Romans 9.6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Romans 9.27 Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Remember, I talked a moment ago about the remnant principle, that God always throughout history has saved a remnant of the Jewish people, because he has a special plan for the remnant. Verse 31, but Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Romans 10.1, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Romans 10.19, but I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation will I anger you. Verse 21, but to Israel he saith, all day long have I stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Paul is clearly talking about a national group of people. He's writing to Gentiles. He's writing to people at Rome. But Paul is very clearly saying and implying at the very least that God still has purposes for Israel. Romans 9, 10, and 11 completely destroy replacement theology. Completely destroy the very non-biblical idea that Israel is the church and the church is Israel. Oh, we could read some more. 
Romans 11, 2. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. I mean, how can you get any plainer than that? God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. Now, Paul is writing this after the day of Pentecost. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. He is writing this after the Samaritans come in in Acts 8. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. He's writing this after the Gentiles have come in in Acts chapter 10. What ye not with the scripture saith of Elias, how he make an intercession to God against Israel. And yet God saved a remnant. God told Elijah, Don't you realize I have 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal? Does God spare a remnant in Israel? You see that all the way through scripture. Romans 11, 25. I'll just give you two more. Verses 25 and 26. Our time is up. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Ah, Paul is going to tell us something that was not clearly understood in the Old Testament. It's a mystery. 17 different things in the New Testament are called mysteries. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so shall all Israel be saved. He's been talking about national Israel. Not changed his topic. So shall all Israel be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Is the church Jacob? Is the church Jacob? He's equating Israel and Jacob here. Those are the two names given to a specific man in the Old Testament who is the progenitor of the twelve tribes of national Israel. People, I know it's fun to read theology. I read a lot of theology. But it is some more, much more edifying to read scripture. To memorize scripture. To meditate upon scripture. It is the word of God that will not return void. It will accomplish that which he pleases. It will prosper in the thing whereto he has sent it. Every word of God is true. All inspiration is from God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Are you studying scripture? Our time is up. I know I have to quit at this point. But Paul talks a lot about Israel. And there are two verses that people say are, well, you know, it can be taken a number of different ways. So therefore, we're going to say these verses mean the church is Israel. In contrast with all the rest of what Paul has to say. The Lord willing, we'll look at those next week. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. Father, we know that false theology leads to wicked practice. And we see the wicked practice that has developed as a result of replacement theology, as a result of the claim that the church is Israel and Israel is the church. And Father, as a result, many Jewish people have suffered through the centuries. Some of them are quite obnoxious and they historical reasoning has been well because they were obnoxious therefore we hit them but father they're your chosen people and you made some promises and we see those promises here in Exodus chapter 6 that you had said you would be their God and you have chosen them for your people and it's in the context of your many I wills 
that you are going to do for Israel as a nation. Father, teach us to believe your word. Teach us to believe your word. And not to be cast to and fro with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lay and wait to deceive. Teach us to believe your word. It is the final authority. It is the touchstone to which we must come back on every issue of theology and practice. Every issue of doctrine. Every issue of the Christian life. Every issue of holiness and righteousness and justice and purity and truth. We pray, Father, that you will take your word as it has gone forth this day. That you will use it in our hearts to draw us closer to Christ so that we might fall at his feet in wonder and adoration and praise. That we might understand that his great love for us is supported and we can see it in his love for Israel. Thank you, Father, for your word. Take it and use it in our hearts. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is number 680, 680, All the Way My Savior.